Okay, well, thank you to everybody who is here. I'm very excited to give a intro on to like what bugs are and a little bit about myself, even though everybody here knows who I am. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see me, my screen? We're good? Yes? Can you see this? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. So while people trickle in, you all know who I am, but in case you forgot who I am, I am Christina. Um, today we're going to be talking about bugs and bugs 101. So first I want to thank 8ball and 8ball community and everybody who put this amazing series together. Um, if you don't know, they've been doing this every day, every single day at 1.30 p.m. They have a lecture, which is just like a really awesome thing to tune into if you're not doing anything in quarantine. And sorry for inviting me. I know this is an old picture from Facebook, but yes. <laughs> don't die. Uh, but yes, thank you for inviting oh, me. You too. <laughs> nice Photoshop. Word. I am... I, graphic design is my passion, as you will see throughout this lecture. Um, so cool. Who am I? So you all know me, but if whatever. I study beetles. Um, these beetles in the upper right hand corner uh, that are they're called serambicids or serambicity. They're longhorn beetles um, and they're called longhorn beetles because they have these really, really long antenna and they eat dead or dying wood. Now there's a fire. There's a fire truck passing right now. OK. It's done. Oop. So um, they eat dead or dying wood, and I studied these beetles in Central and South America and why they ate certain types of wood over others to use as a lens for climate change research. Um, so yeah, they're really important. There are some beetles in this group that do eat live trees, but I don't study the ones that eat live trees. And I studied this in a combined BSMS at the City College of New York. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, where I teach an ecology class, a intro bio class, and a physical science class. And in the fall, I'll be starting my PhD at Teachers College, Columbia University, where I will be studying science education. So particularly figuring out a way that we can make ecology the centerpiece of K through 12 science education. So some questions, I'm gonna try to, move this there we go so there are going to be answering a lot of questions today first and foremost what are bugs and why should we care about them and maybe you deal with them in a natural context like you see a ladybug or like sari right now who's living with a horse fly in her apartment and it's harassing her or maybe you deal with bugs in a non-natural context i feel like I am one of the few people on planet Earth right now not playing Animal Crossing New Horizons, but whenever I'm posting a TikTok um, and I post about an insect, literally every comment is, oh my God, this bug is in Animal Crossing. So cool. Maybe you know bugs from Animal Crossing. Maybe you've seen a bug in real life. Um, but from this point on in this lecture, I am not going to be referring to insects as bugs uh, because they are not the same thing. They are not synonyms. Uh, bu a bug is a particular, particular type of insect. They're called true bugs. They're in one specific order of insects, and they're insects that have sucking mouth parts. Uh, so when we're referring to insects, it is the whole group of insects, and bugs are a type of insects. So I'm going to answer a few questions today. We're going to define what insects are. Uh, I'm going to do my top three cool picks of types of insects. Uh, Figure much like why should we care about insects in the first place? How can you learn more about nature? We're gonna talk a little bit about citizen science. And then I'm gonna end briefly, we're gonna take a little bit of a sad turn, but then we're gonna end on a happy note and we're gonna talk about the future of science communication. So we can't talk about insects without first zooming out to kind of what is an arthropod, because we know that Insects are like they have this exoskeleton, they're an invertebrate, but there are lots of other animals that are also invertebrates, right? So what makes an insect different from all of these other invertebrate animals? So what an arthropod is, it's an invertebrate animal that has an exoskeleton, a segmented body, 
and paired joint appendages. So arthropods include insects, arachnids, myropods, and crustaceans. And that's what these are. In the upper left-hand corner, you could see a shrimp, which is an example of a crustacean. We all know shrimps and our lobsters and our crabs. Uh, those are all crustaceans. Then in the upper right-hand corner, you could see myropods, which are our centipedes over here, and then our um, millipedes. So that, that's what a myropod is. And then we pretty, we should maybe all know what arachnids are, you know, arachnophobia, fear of spiders, right? But scorpions are also arachnids. Um, and also ticks are arachnids and bed bugs are arachnids. They are not insects. Uh, the spider that you see here is a jumping spider. If anybody watches the cute little YouTube videos of Lucas, uh, maybe you've seen them on Facebook. It's like a cute little animated spider that talks. This is the spider that Lucas is like made after. Uh, it's like a cute little jumping spider. But then we have all of these guys, which are insects. And how are they different from all the other arthropods? So arthropod or arthropoda is a phylum. So how we organize living things is called taxonomy, which is pioneered by our boy Linnaeus in the 1700s. And it's essentially, we're just drilling down into more specificity, specificity, and grouping living things that are alike. So while there's arthropod, which is a phylum, that's a bigger group than insects or insecta, which is a class. Now the word insecta or the singular insectum is Latin derived. It comes from the first declension Latin verb insectare, which means to cut up. Um, and that's because a huge part of what makes an insect an insect are, is their three part segmented body. So insecta is the largest group in the arthropod phylum. They have a chitinous exoskeleton, a three-part body, three pairs of jointed legs, compound eyes, and one pair of antennae. Now, a chitinous exoskeleton. So what that means is they have an exoskeleton made out of chitin. Chitin is basically just long chains of polysaccharides. It's what insect shells are made out of, but also the, wall, the cell walls of fungi. A cool thing that's being done right now is isolating chitin from like fungi and different insects to make sustainable packaging for materials. So there's like lots of other external sustainable uses for this stuff. Um, and here's a, oops. And here's a better picture of all that. Uh, so this is a beetle, uh, but that doesn't matter right now. But this is essentially what makes an insect an insect. So at the top, we have the two antennae, we have the two compound eyes, and this three-part segmented body. The top being the head, the middle part being the thorax, and the whole bottom, last third of an insect being the abdomen. And of course, we have the mouth parts, and what makes a beetle a beetle are these electra, but we'll get into that. Insects are the most diverse group of animals. They include more than a million described species and represent more than half of all known living organisms. The total number of extant species is estimated at between six to 10 million. Now the word extant is the opposite of the word extinct. So extant means everything that's just alive today and not extinct like the dinosaurs. Potentially over 90% of all animal life on Earth are insects. So if there was an evolutionary arms race, the insects kind of won that one for the animals. And this is a breakdown of the entire class Insecta into the orders. So that's the next, we're drilling down in, ta in taxonomy. Order is the next one. It's, it's phylum, phylum class, then order. So these are the different insect orders that make up the class that is Insecta, yes. I, do, I talk a lot with my hands. I mean, <laughs> so the largest group in Insecta are the beetles. Big shock there. Coleoptera. And you can see that at the, in the bottom right here. Coleoptera in Latin just means covered wings. If we go back to our little diagram here, uh, it's because all beetles have to have electra. So it's this hard covering of chitin on top of their wings. That's what makes a beetle a beetle. Um, next is Hymenoptera. So Hymenoptera makes 13% of all insects, and that is bees, wasps, and ants. Hymenoptera in Latin, uh, well, hymen is a Greek prefix, and it means membrane. Um, the term Hymenoptera, we don't really know where it comes from, but 
hymen is also from the Greek god of marriage. And we think it's because of the way their wings are always together while they fly and they have membrane channels in them. It's a little bit of a murky definition. Uh, next up is diptera at 12%. Diptera has an easy derivation in Latin that just means die meaning two, terra meaning wings. All, all true flies have two wings. And then Lepidoptera at 16%. Um, and essentially Lepidoptera are just butterflies and moths. And they're called Lepidoptera because what Lepidoptera means in Latin is scaly wings. I'm not sure if anybody's ever touched a butterfly or a moth, but if you touch their wing, you get like all of their scales. They're like dusty. Um, so basically we're gonna go through these four orders and explain why they're cool. Oh, and before I leave this slide, if you see on the upper right-hand corner, hemiptera, so this little blue slice, that's what we call bugs. Um, everything else is not a bug. This little blue slice, those are the only insects that are bugs. Of course, we got to start with our beetles. 40% of described insects and 25% of all known animal life forms. So if you put one representative of every species of animal that we know on earth into a bag and picked one out at random, you would have a one fourth chance of pulling out a beetle. Um, why do we think that is? Why are there so many beetles? We think it's because they co-evolved with angiosperms. So angiosperms are all flowering plants. And so obviously no evolution happens in a vacuum, right? You're, uh, you're constantly evolving based on all of the different environmental factors that are you know, around you. That's how evolution works. But co-evolution is a, a specific type of evolution where, where we're gonna get into later with fig wasps and figs, you can't disassociate one with, from the other. So we think that beetles co-evolved with angiosperms and as angiosperms radiated in the late Cretaceous, so did beetles. Um, and that's why we see so much specialization in, in beetles where they eat different parts of plants. And this is a fun fact, ladybugs are beetles. Uh, that's why a lot of people call them ladybird beetles because they're not bugs, they are beetles. And we like ladybugs because they eat aphids and aphids are a huge agricultural pest. So ladybugs are cool. Next, we're gonna do Hymenoptera, which are bees, ants, and wasps. We got a couple of fun words here. We, um, Hymenoptera isn't the only insect order that has eusociality, but it's kind of a hallmark of this order. So we're gonna cover it here. Parthenogenesis and parasitoids. So what does it mean to be eusocial? It essentially means extreme task specialization in a genetic context where there's different tasks, castes. You have queens, you have workers, you have males, and you are born into a caste. And essentially that the genetics of what puts you there is your job. So, you know, are you collecting food? Are you farming fungus? These are leaf cutter ants, by the way. You know, are you a reproductive female? Are you a drone male? So that's what eusociality is. All ants are eusocial. Not all bees are eusocial. Actually, most bees are solitary bees, but we all know the honeybee, right? Honeybees are eusocial. Most wasps are not eusocial. What you see pictured here is a wasp. Um, ter all termites are eusocial, but termites aren't in this order. And fun fact, the only eusocial mammal that we have are the naked mole rats. Uh, so they have extreme genetic caste specialization, which is weird, um, but whatever, eusocial. Parthenogenesis. So again, Hymenopter isn't the only order that has parthenogenesis, walking sticks do this as well. But essentially what parthenogenesis is, is that you can asexually re reproduce. So females can lay eggs and just duplicate their chromosome and they don't need males to reproduce. So we see this in Hymenoptera. And a huge part of the diversity in Hymenoptera are the parasitoid wasps. And that's what you see pictured here. It's a cuckoo wasp. And the cuckoo wasps uh, are, cuckoo. No, no, no. They, they basically, they lay eggs in different like nests of insects. And essentially the, do I get, do I have questions? Chat. 
Yeah, I don't need many word. Yeah, no, I, I'd say a common thing in the insect world is that you realize how useless men are from parthenogenesis to eusociality where men are just haploid drones and once they mate a few hours later they die. Um, and that's all they're used for. So yeah, that we, we see this time and time again in the insect world. Uh, but with parthenogenesis, you don't need men and it's uh, pretty cool. With parasitoids, uh, they lay eggs in their nest and then essentially the, what, when they hatch, they eat the food that was supposed to be for the young in that nest and then they end up eating the young as well. But this wasp is really, really pretty. I think a lot of the parasit parasitoid wasps are pretty and they're very small. Next, if my slides cooperate or not, that's fine. Cool, flies. Now I picked this specifically because you could see the fly in the upper right hand corner and the lower left hand corner looks a lot like this wasp. And the fly in the upper left hand corner looks a lot like a bumblebee. And obviously there are, in every insect order, we see things mimicking each, each other, but this is just a good opportunity to talk about mim mimicry. So there's a ton of mimicry in the insect world um, and why insects mimic other insects is for protection. So we see like walking stick babies that look like ants. In fact, there's a whole type of mimicry called, oh, I'm gonna mess this up. It's called mimicrorphy. It's essentially the prefix for ants. It's like M-Y-C something something. You're allowed to mess that up. Cool. I can't pronounce it for the life of me. I, I literally <laughs> allow it. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, and essentially, it's this whole type of mimicry that peep that where insects just mimic ants because that's how batshit crazy ants are. Ants are literally insane. They destroy everything. Different clans are fighting with each other. So it's an evolutionary advantage to mimic things in Hymenoptera because they're nuts. Because people won't, the, it, the other insects won't mess with you if you look like a bee, a wasp, or an ant. Uh, so in flies, we see mimics. Flies are really important pollinators. So when we think of pollinators, we think of bumblebees and honeybees, but there are a lot of other really important insect pollinators. In fact, flies are the most important pollinators behind the ones in Hymenoptera, also moths and butterflies and beetles. Some flies drink tears. They aren't the only organisms that do this, but like the tears that come out of your eyes, tears. Um, don't Google pictures of that. You'll be horrified and never leave the house. Um, I got another one in the chat. Yes, bite, good. If you don't belong to the group on Facebook where we all pretend to be ants, you are missing out uh, because that is my favorite pastime on planet Earth right now. And everybody just pretends to be an ant. I can drop the information in the chat when I'm done with this talk. the best thing in the world. Yeah, it's it, amazing. It, it's, yeah. Incredible. So some, in, so some flies actually drink tears. Don't Google this because you'll be horrified. Um, they aren't the only animals in the world that drink tears, uh, but they drink the tears to get salt and minerals that come out of the tears. That's where the term like crocodile tears come from, comes from. And you see like the pictures where butterflies are covering crocodiles. It's because they're drinking the salt secretions off of the crocodile uh, for the salt and mineral content. I don't know why this keeps freezing, but that's fine. Okay, and lastly, we have the, the left Lepidoptera butterflies and moths. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what is the difference between butterflies and moths? And a lot of people say, oh, moths are the ugly ones and butterflies are the pretty ones, and that's not true. Uh, what you see pictured here is a moth. It's, I actually have a pinned in my room. It's a Madagascar rainbow moth that is also in Animal Crossing, which I learned from posting a TikTok about it, and people freaked out that it was in Animal Crossing. Um, the only difference between butterflies and moths is that butterflies, when they're resting on something, have their wings closed and moths have their wings open. And butterflies have, oops, butterflies have long, thin antenna with lobes at the ends. And whereas moths have like feathery antenna that are shorter. And that's the only difference between butterflies and moths. Um, things in Lepidoptera, we call their larval stage caterpillars. And the silkworms are also a larval or caterpillar of the silkworm uh, moth. Yes, chat. Oh, Danny's here. Hi, Danny. Um, <laughs> we also, again, this is the, isn't the only place that we 
uh, see this, but uh, a good time to bring it up is the concept of structural color. Oh my God, why, why is it doing this? Okay, so here we see a blue morpho butterfly. I also have this pinned in my bedroom. Um, and there is absolutely no blue pigment in this butterfly. It has nanostructures on its scales that reflect the wavelength of blue light. So we perceive this as blue light, uh, as, as the color blue, but there is no blue pigment in this butterfly. So people study this butterfly specifically and structural color in general for textile innovations and just innovation in material science as well uh, to see how we can make things colors without using pigment. Uh, so really, really cool. Okay, three super cool insects, my top three picks. Uh, the first two are basic and the, the, the last one's kind of freaky. Cool, all right, so we all know dung beetles, right? So we, they aren't just in Africa, they're on every continent except Antarctica, although the famous ones are in Africa. And there are rollers and there are tunnelers. So there are dung beetles that roll up poop and they kind of dance on the little poop ball. And then there's tunnelers and they're, they're the ones that bury the dung underground and they make these tunnels. What do they do with the poop? So they one, they eat it two, they mate on it, and three, they lay their young in it to use as a food source when they emerge. Um, and dung beetles were worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. They, dung beetles are a type of scarab beetle. And what the ancient Egyptians thought, because they saw these beetles like rolling on their little dung balls, is that, that there was a beetle on top of the earth that was running on it, and that's how the earth was spinning. Uh, so they thought that beetles kept the world go round, and that's why they worshipped them. Honestly, I think I would do well in ancient Egypt. Um, but there's a really, really cool fact about dung beetles, one specific species of dung beetle in Africa, and they're one of the only known invertebrates that actually use and track the constellations in the Milky Way galaxy for their movement. And that's how you get a lot of ridiculous pictures and memes like this that the science people made of beetles rolling on dung balls in space. Uh, but I think these next two examples, it's kind of amazing because an insect brain is only two millimeters, right? Super, super, super small. And how does an organism with a brain that small figure out how to track the Milky Way galaxies for their movement, right? It almost doesn't even make sense. Uh, so a lot of people study insects and specifically like their neurons and how they're able to store information to use in technology innovation because they're storing a lot of information in a really, really, really small space. And then we have the monarch, specifically this one subspecies. Uh, so it's Danis plexipus plexipus. And so there are a bunch of species of monarchs, but it's only this subspecies that do the migration. So if you don't know, um, monarchs have the longest migration of any invertebrate. It's 3,000 miles. Um, and they're the only invertebrate that does a two-way migration, like birds. So they overwinter somewhere and then they go back. And this is what it looks like. So they overwinter in warm places like in California and like the famous one in Mexico. And then they go back we don't actually know where they go. This is kind of a big unanswered question in science. Um, it's like, we know where they're overwintering, but then kind of after that they disperse and then they all go back to one place and then they disperse again. Uh, and, and an interesting fact about monarchs is that they eat, um, their, their larvae, I should say, eat the milkweed plant. Um, and milkweeds are really, really toxic. They have a whole bunch of cardiac glycosides in them. So if you were to ingest like cardiac glycosides, it mimics the sodium potassium pump channels and it basically makes your heart go crazy and you have a heart attack um, if you don't need it. So they are able though to sequester the cardi the, these cardiac glycosides out of the food source when they eat it. So that's a cool fun fact. But yeah, but they do this crazy migration. Um, and the weirdest part is like one butterfly doesn't do the whole trip. So it's not like one monarch is overwintering and then goes back. Essentially, like they go 
to their overwintering spot and then they lay a bunch of eggs and then they have a whole bunch of generations. So you could see here, they're the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of the original population that overwintered and then they go back. So it's not a learned behavior because they are so far, the butterflies that are making the migration are three or four generations removed from the descendants that overwintered and made the migration for them to be born. Uh, so not a learned behavior. So it is encoded in genetics, which is again, crazy considering they have a two millimeter brain. Um, and we don't know how they know how to do this. Uh, it could be the magnetic pull of the earth. It could be that they follow the sun. It could be a combination of a whole bunch of things, uh, but they're still trying to figure that out. Okay. How many people here eat figs? Hopefully a lot of you. Um, I like figs. Um, I'm sorry if I'm about to ruin figs for you. Um, my students hate when I talk about this because I ruin figs for them. Uh, but figs are in the plant family Moraceae. Specifically, figs are in the genus Ficus. There are 850 species. And figs are not fruits. Figs are flowers. They are inverted flowers. Uh, with all of their reproductive parts inside of this, this fleshy casing. Uh, so the real question is, how do they get pollinated if all of their reproductive parts are inside? Enter the fig wasp. Um, this is an absolutely horrific figure. Please ignore everything that's written. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, the science people need to make a better fig wasp figure because this is the most popular one used and it was created in 1999 and they don't understand. Uh, so we're going to start in the topper, the upper right hand, left hand corner here. Um, this, yeah, it's just, it's terrible. So in the upper left hand corner, this is a female fig wasp. She is going to enter the, a fig through a small opening at the bottom of the fig. In the process, she loses most of her limbs and her wings. It's quite gruesome. She gets inside of the fig. She, carrying pollen from a previous fig, pollinates this fig and also lays her eggs inside of the fig. So she's pollinating the fig and she lays her eggs. She dies inside of the fig. The first fig wasps to emerge from the eggs that she laid are the male fig wasps. They mate with their sisters while they are still in embryo, and then they also die inside of the fig. Then the impregnated female fig wasps emerge. They gather some of the pollen and they leave the fig. Now, before the males died, they made a whole bunch of holes through the fig so that the females can go through. So the impregnated female fig wasp with the pollen then leaves the fig to go find a, another fig to start the process again. And it's really crazy, an insane co-evolutionary relationship because there is one species of fig wasp to one species of fig. So it, this is better than a chicken and egg situation because we, we know that eggs came way before chickens. That is a stupid analogy. Uh, what came first, the fig wasp or the fig? I don't know. Uh, but it's kind of this crazy relationship. And this like visual representation here is the least complex of the fig wasp and fig relationship. It actually gets a lot more complex than this. Uh, but should you still eat figs? When you eat a fig, are you eating bugs? Most likely not. Uh, so we eat f figs from the common fig and essentially there are male and female trees. The male trees are still pollinated, but the female trees aren't. So we eat so if, you're, so if you're buying figs in the grocery store, you're most likely not eating a wasp. Sometimes the wasps get confused and they go into the female trees. So you might eat like a little baby wasp or two, but you're not eating like a fig full of wasps when you eat a fig. Why should we care about insects? So it's this concept that we talk a lot about in ecology called ecosystem services. And what ecosystem services are, it's the many and varied benefits that humans freely gain from the natural environment and from properly functioning ecosystems. Think about like everything insects do for us from all of the pollination to, you know, recycling nutrients back into the soil to predation, you know, keeping all of the insect pests out of control, like I was just talking about with the ladybugs. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. 
And essentially, you know, nature does trillions of dollars of work for us for free. So we need a properly functioning ecosystem so that the insects do their jobs and we can continue things like grow plants and eat food and all the things that are necessary for us to survive. How to identify insects in your neighborhood. So if you have your phone in front of you right now, or you could just take a picture of this and download this later, uh, this is an app called iNaturalist. Um, and this is an incredible app. What you can do is you can take pictures of insects that you see outside. You, when you take a picture, there's like a, a line underneath the picture that you took, which is su called suggestions. And basically it's just a bunch of scientists that over time have accrued so much data that from your picture, they can tell you, and obviously there's a margin of error here, but they can kind of tell you uh, what you're looking at. And it's not just insects, it's any type of living thing. So go outside and you could take pictures of different plants and bugs and animals that you see. Uh, you can identify them and other, you can discuss your findings. And if you also download the app, you can, there's a map and you could see all of the different biodiversity in your neighborhood. neighborhood. So iNaturalist, it's a great quarantine activity uh, to do if you live by a park and not even if you live by a park, we all have street trees uh, by us. Okay. So I always get a bunch of questions when people figure out that I study insects and I figure I'll just answer them now before I get them at the end of this lecture. Why do mosquitoes exist? This is the most popular question that I get like by far. Do, like why do mosquitoes exist? I don't understand. Um, mosquitoes are important. Like nothing just evolves in nature just because. Um, you know, nature is controlled by a whole bunch of negative feedback loops of everything keeping each other in check. Um, mosquito as larvae, they're aquatic. So like different fish and aquatic things eat them. And then when they become adults, different birds and reptiles eat them. So they're a really important food source. What about roaches? Uh, roaches are like the garbage men of the forest. They're like eating everything and recycling all those nutrients back into the soil so plants can grow, similar to my beetles that eat dead wood. Why do bees make honey? Well, specifically right honeybees in the genus Apis. Um, and they make honey as a food source. A lot of people don't know that. So bees eat honey. Um, and it's really important in the winter where there's no nectar or flowers, uh, it's like they're storing food for the winter. And how they make honey is a bee, like a honey bee goes to a flower and they're drinking nectar and they're filling these, these special organs that they have with nectar. Once they're filled, they go back to the hive and they basically pass the nectar mouth to mouth from bee to bee until it significantly reduces in moisture and then they vomit the honey into the beeswax wax combs that we know and beeswax is made from a gland they have a special glands that secrete wasps that they build uh, their honeycombs with do I swallow insects while I sleep? Everybody's seen this, like, oh, you swallow like a spider and eat insects while you sleep. No, you don't. This is like a stupid, I don't know where this even came from, who started this. Um, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, insects are smarter than that. What is your favorite type of insect? Um, and obviously I'm very biased, but this is kind of the star of the types of beetles that I study. This is Acrocyanus longimanus. Um, it's native to South America. This was also on my like second slide in this presentation. Um, and I don't like this beetle for any particular reason. Other than that, it's kind of the prettiest one out of all of the beetles that I study. Um, and he's huge. Uh, if I saw this in the forest, I think I would pass out from excitement. I'm always seeing on all of the insect groups, like, oh, I was just like walking in this random town in Colombia and it landed on me. I think if Acrocyanus landed on me, you would have to resuscitate me because I would just be so excited. Not from fear, just excitement. Oh yeah, you're gonna think about every time you add honey to tea, yep. Honey is bee vomit, yep, yum, delicious. Why are we? freezing. Okay, so there is way, there is so much that we didn't cover today. There are walking sticks that look like leaves. There are 
caddis flies that aren't actually flies are in a totally different order but their larvae basically make these little like tunnely things and if you give them jewels and materials to make jewelry they'll make jewelry for you so people sell jewelry made by caddis flies uh, we didn't even talk about dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, this is a picture of dragonflies mating and they form a heart, uh, but it's actually quite gruesome the way that they mate. Uh, the male drowns the female underwater until she accepts his sperm and it basically is guaranteed that, is, that it is his sperm that fertilized her eggs. So that's fun. And they do that five times. We didn't talk about praying mantises and the mantises that look like orchids. We didn't talk about beetles that look like giraffes. Uh, but moral of the story is that insects are insanely biodiverse. And it's our job to protect this biodiversity because we're currently in the middle of the sixth mass extinction event that has ever happened in the history of Earth. Um, Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And this has only happened five times in the past. We're in the middle of the sixth one and we caused it. 99% um, of all species that are threatened today are threatened because of three reasons, habitat loss, invasive species, and climate change. Uh, so all of this biodiversity is disappearing quickly. And there are so many insects that we haven't even discovered yet. So species are going extinct before we even realize that they existed. And we are in the middle of what they're deeming the insect apocalypse. Uh, there have been so many articles written about this. We're losing not just pollinators, but essential insects that do really important ecosystem services. So what can we do about it? I mean, I do sciencey stuff, but what can like everybody do about it? So if you know me, you know that I run the bio bitch. Uh, this is a picture of Instagram, but I'm mainly on TikTok. Um, I just kind of cross post my TikToks to Instagram. And I think this is just a big testament to just the future of science and science communication. You know, it's a huge issue with science and how we got into this mess in the first place is that scientific research stays in the ivory tower of science. It doesn't affect our real lives. We have known that climate change is going to happen for over a hundred years, since 1896, and we have done absolutely nothing to stop it. So I think it's our job, not just as scientists, but just as members of the human race, to take it, whatever field you work in, it doesn't even have to be in insects, whatever field that you, you do, and just start making positive change. Because this is transcendent. The biggest ad advocates for like the green movement and environmentalism, they aren't scientists, it's artists, it's writers. I think like probably the best example of this is Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. You know, she wrote Silent Spring in the 1960s, not as a book for scientists, but as a book for everybody to know like, hey, DDT is killing birds. And if we don't stop using DDT, we're going to have a silent spring. And over 2 million copies were sold. And it's one of the best examples of science communication that we have in modern history. So not that I'm comparing myself to Rachel because I didn't write a book that changed the world, uh, but I make TikToks. I make really short informational things about bugs, about plants, about the environment. Um, and I think as we go forward, you know, science and science communication content is getting shorter and shorter. So in all of our fields, we need to be able to make really informational content that is 30 or 60 seconds long. So I hope that you all take a second and look at the beetles on the sidewalk, just like I look at the beetles on the sidewalk and have a little bit of a greater appreciation to how complex nature is um, and talk more about it and get more involved in your local community gardens. And even if it's just picking up a plastic bottle off of the street and throwing it in recycling, you're doing your part. If there's anybody here that wants to collaborate for any creative projects, I'm available. Uh, follow me on, at, at the bio bitch on TikTok and Instagram. Here is my email. And I would love to take any questions everybody has or comments, general stuff. I have a question, like the bug you were showing, the favorite, uh, your favorite one, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. How big yeah. is it? Huge. Um, it's like the size of your, let me, hold on, let me stop sharing this nonsense. I don't know why am I 
stop share. Yes, do that. Okay. It's like the size of my palm. Oh, okay. That's pretty Average big. Is it's like the size of my palm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got, what's going on in the chat? I love walking sticks. Yes, they're cute. They're, they're friendly. We like them. Hi, I have a question. Yes, Dad. My question is, why in Godzilla, Mothra was the queen of the monsters? Because the insects rule the world. It would be the only logical leader for any type of badass megafauna squad. You know, yeah. it would have to be an insect because the insects rule. And the name of the company was Monarch. See? See? Said it's right up your alley. You see that? <laughs> My little Boricua daughters. <laughs> I mean, you know, Christina. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions? If not, thank you for coming. I'm going to go take a walk in Fort Tryon Park. I hope you all learned something today. Go outside and appreciate a tree. Um, and have a great rest of your Sunday.